I appreciate uh, being asked to give this talk. It's my first visit to CAS meeting, and um, it's uh, been enjoyable so far. So, um, you know, actually, my talk is going to dovetail really nicely with what John was saying because it's just an evolution in technology. Um, let's see. Here are my disclosures. And so, robots. Um, uh, what do they do? You know, when you think about a robot, I think, you know, what comes to mind? I think uh, it's something like uh, the picture I'm showing here. When, when I think about a robot, I, I think about a device that does a task. And in this picture, it's folding a piece of clothing. It should do it autonomously, quickly, you know, reliably, consistently. That's what, we, that's what I think about when I think about a robot. But when it comes to um, a spinal robot, it's not what it does. It's not an autonomous device. It's, it's an assistive device that really only impacts one portion of the procedure. That, that's today. I don't think that'll be the future, but that's today. So when you, when you think about what a spinal robot will do in this day and age, it's really optimized for pedicle screw placement, also probably cortical screw trajectory-based screws, and ideally percutaneous fixation. Really, you can use it for an open approach, but you have to really plan for it. Uh, because you have to have an, a correct incision uh, that is, uh, will allow a screw placement. Because when you plan these screws, they're really medialized. So you need actually a much bigger opening for an open op operation. Um, the, uh, the most current generation robots nowadays will also allow navigation. So that's another um, aspect that's evolved, right? It's not using the arm, but it's navigation capable. So when you look at the literature, and we always look at the literature when we're, we're assessing um, a new technique or a device, uh, there's actually been quite a bit of uh, publications or quite a number of publications looking at the spinal robot, and it's really focused on uh, a few areas. Really, accuracy, which uh, is what it, it started with, right? Implant accuracy. It's also looked at radiation exposure, operative time, length of stay, so important uh, aspects that we all look for. Uh, length of stay, I'm really not going to talk about uh, because I, I think there's too many variables with length of stay. It depends on the condition, patient expectation. There's a lot of variables that I don't think the robot really factors into uh, so much. And there's really only a few studies looking at that. So I'm really going to highlight the first three uh, topics, implant accuracy, radiation exposure, and operative time. So when you're looking at screw accuracy, it's just high. I'll, I'll just start off by saying it's going to be high. Uh, there's about 30 uh, articles that assess pedicle screw accuracy. 15 use uh, the standard Gertzman and Robbins uh, criteria, which is a CT-based criteria, which is very straightforward. Others use other criteria. I, j I just point out 15 use sort of a standard criteria. Uh, and the accuracy was actually very high. 26 of the studies showed greater than 90% accuracy. Right? There's a few outliers, uh, and the, the four uh, outliers w was really in the mid to high 80s. Really, There's only one real outlier, and there's a 75% accuracy. And I, I want to talk about that just briefly. And this is uh, the, the study itself. Uh, it was published in Neurosurgery Focus from Mike Wang's group. Uh, it was really a small study. It was their initial experience. And uh, so when you look at it, it's, it's actually a really small sample size, but it highlights an issue. Um, uh, of uh, robotic screw placement, partic particularly when you look at the percutaneous group. And, you, uh, and there's only 24 screws. Six of them were, uh, had a breech doll. And, and, and it was very clear cut why. It was a skiving phenomenon. So you're not looking at the anatomy uh, when you're putting these percutaneous screws in with a robot. Remember, the robot's outside the patient and it's giving you a trajectory. So depending on the surrounding bone morphology, it could cause some skiving, meaning the, the tip of whatever instrument you're using will deflect because of uh, the abnormal anatomy. So in the lumbar spine, it's a hypertrophic facet joint. So it'll push you a little bit laterally, the tip, so you could have a lateral um, misplacement. Whereas in a thoracic spine, the TP in a rib will push things medially. So you're not able to see that at all. And with navigation, this is what John was alluding to, sometimes you could be thrown off because of the surrounding bone. In an open case, it's not so much of a problem because you could see that and you could drill down the surrounding bone to make it a better surface for your initial starting point. But that's a common uh, potential problem with a robot. Um, you could get away from that just by understanding that and planning appropriately. Uh, the next uh, area that uh, peop uh, people have looked at when, it looks to, uh, when you're looking at the literature is radiation exposure. And this is very important, if you ask me. I'm an older surgeon now, um, and I've been practicing now 14 years. In my first, I want to say, decade, I'm a heavy MI surgeon, so I, I irradiated myself, wore lead, sweaty. And I, I agree with John, as you get older, it's just, it just gets old. 
So I've, I've occurred in my practice to navigation now robotics because I don't wear lead in all, whether it's lateral cases, uh, posterior cases, you just don't need to with current technology. And so when, uh, when you look at the literature on radiation exposure with the robot, it, it was a little bit surprising to me. The data was mixed. The majority showed decreased radiation exposure, which is what I expected. But there was a handful of studies that really didn't show um, decreased radiation. In fact, it showed increased uh, radiation exposure, and, and if you drill down why, you get, uh, it's because the comparison group was freehand. So you took percutaneous robotic usage and compared it to a freehand group. You know, I, I, I freehanded a lot of screws, and I still do for my big open cases, and I don't take any pictures. You know, if there's a problem, I'll take a fluoroscopic image. Otherwise, I just use surface topography in your field and just put a screw down, and I'll get a picture at the end of the case. And if everything looks good, fine. So when, when your comparison group is freehand, it's not surprising you're, not, you're gonna probably get increased radiation exposure with uh, using a robot. So I, I think there's a caveat. I think in general, it's gonna decrease your radiation exposure. So that, that's a potential benefit that I think will be more clear cut as more studies come along. You know, operative time. So, um, uh, you know, as, as we get, you know, farther along, you see there are less studies, right? So operative time uh, was also mixed. And, uh, it, it showed really that robotic placement probably was not conducive to a quicker operation. I, and I actually agree. So we, in our institution, we've had a robot for a year and a half now. And there was a learning curve issue, so it sped up a bit. But I still think compared to, let's say, a navigated MIS case or a freehand case, it's probably not going to be quicker. Right? So there's, there's a trade-off. There's probably increased accuracy compared to freehand. But it's just going to take you a little longer. And I think depending on the condition, um, I, I still think it's worth it. But so operative time, as, of, as it stands right now, and the technology is improving, and workflow will improve, but as it stands now, I'm not sure there's a big time savings. Um, so in summary, I'm just gonna just summarize. It's highly accurate. It can potentially decrease radiation exposure, and I, I think that's a true finding. And over time, I, I think as the technology improves and, and we get more comfortable with it, I, I think operative time will also probably decrease. And I just want to quickly go through a case example of how it could be used just now. Not, not just for screw placement, but with the navigation capability of the robot, it can impact every aspect of the procedure. So this is something you see all the time. We've had this debate, uh, and this is uh, germane to it, uh, from uh, earlier this morning. 63-year-old man, back in leg pain, activity limited. Something you see every day in your clinic, right? So here's his MRI. And uh, on the MRI, you can see that you know, he's got high-grade stenosis, very clear cut there. Maybe a minimal spondy, but he's got fluid in his joints. I get x-rays on these, flexion extension. You can see he's got a mobile spondy. And I, I think most people would fuse this. I, I, we've had this debate, but I think most people in this audience would probably fuse this. And there are a variety of options. Do lateral perk screws, traditional open lamming, uh, posterior fixation. And I chose to treat this uh, with an MIST lift, and I use a robot for it. Okay? I'm just going to highlight how it could be used here. And I'm not going to wear lead throughout this procedure. I'm going to take very few floral shots. And I'm going to highlight this. Just very standard Jackson frame positioning. Um, so when you use a, a robot, I think it's true for all robots. You often, uh, obviously, robotic uh, screw placement is based on a navigation platform. So you need a reference frame for the patient. If you're going to use interoperative image acquisition, typically you need some sort of um, ICT registry uh, or CT registration. That's what that is. And I do what John just showed. I just re-drape and just bring the ORM in. We've timed this, actually. Oops. I don't know if I can I go back. Yeah. So we timed how long this takes. It takes six to 10 minutes to get image acquisition transfer data. Not a big time sink, OK? Um, so this is a planning station, very straightforward, three-dimensional planning. You know, I, I use CT here. This, this gives you a gross view. And then you, just your, your planning uh, um, uh, screens here. Very straightforward. It takes, like, no time, less than a minute. And probably like 20 seconds of screw here. And it's very easy to plan a screw. You could look at, uh, you could change the screw length, diameter. Also, you could look at the angulation. You could see here to make sure they're symmetric. Very straightforward in the planning. Uh, does not take very long. You could do it if there's different ways of doing this. You could get a pre op CT and plan ahead. And so, so it's an OR. Or you could do interop, which is what I do. And so I'm just going to, here's just a short video if you can run that. Oops, can you go back? Can you run it? Uh, it does not take very long. I just want to show it to you. You just move the screw around. You know, I'm in a training program, so I, I, I'm always showing the residents what to do, and this is what the residents kind of doing it. Okay, you could uh, advance it. So, and advance it. Oh, can you run this one too? So this, this is our chief resident. He's actually a vast. He's going to be a vascular neurosurgeon. He's actually in uh, Boston right now doing his fellowship. This is the first time using a robot, and. Uh, 
So this is his absolute first time. I'm just telling him this, uh, like uh, what to do here. So it's just a two-step process. So he's going to take this drill that's navigated. And you can see we've already planned the screws here, small paramedian incision. And he's a little uncomfortable because he can't see anything. Right? He's, not, uh, he's not used to this. So he's going to be a little tentative here. But this is his absolute first case, and he's looking at the screen now. So he's just a little tentative because, and what I'm, what I'm telling him is that like he's going to feel resistance when he hits a bone, and he's going to kind of just give. So there, he's, he's give, it's given, and he's going to go. But very tentative. I can tell you the next screw, he just didn't even bat an eye. He just drilled through it. So it's twice as quick. What I'm explaining here is the facet joint could be large. So if, if we don't plan correctly, we could skive here. That's all I was saying here. Now he's going to put the screw down. So if the clock's not visible here, but this took a minute. So his first time ever is just a minute, and like again, uh, you know, when you use navigation, as John was saying, there there is some like uh, coordination involved, looking at the screen and, and putting a screw down. Here with a robot with a rigid arm, you don't really need that. So anyone could put a screw in for yeah, as long as you plan it. So there's some savings there. So um, I'm just going to advance it because of time issues. Uh, so this is where uh, the other aspects of a navigation system can be used now. So I, I'm going to doctor tube right now. I haven't used any fluoro. I don't know if you saw in the video, we're not wearing lead at all. I'm taking no fluoro for this whole case at this point. And so for the tu a tubular retractor placement, I'm just putting a, the pointer down that's available with this navigation system. It's elementary right now. So I'm going to plan my tube position just based on this. I'll dilate and check again with the pointer, make sure I'm at a, uh, you know, in the correct trajectory. Now I've done a unilateral approach for a bilateral decompression. So this is a contralateral side. This is ligament deflavum. We see this all the time. Ligament deflavum is gone. This is a contralateral lateral recess. And I'm going to put the pointer down make sure I got an adequate decompression because when it comes to an MIS case and on the contralateral inferior side, there's a chance you can leave a residual. With a navigation capability, I could just check with a pointer. So all I'm doing here is I'm, I put the pointer down. I'm on a contralateral recess. I've undercut the contralateral lamina. And I know I have an adequate decompression here. Here's a post-op uh, CT, and you can see I've done the adequate decompression, very representative. But it gives me, me some comfort that I've done an adequate decompression, and I'm just using the navigation capability. So the, ro the robotic unit is impacting every aspect of the procedure. And going forward, this is going to be refined, and it'll, th you'll probably have a better image guidance system available. But this is just the initial iteration. Same thing with the cage placement. I have the pointer in a disk space, and I'm in line with my tubes. So I know the cage is going to go there. So it gives me some uh, sense that it's going to be a midline cage, and Cage, it looks midline, use an expandable cage. And uh, again, it's impacting other aspects of the procedure, and I think that's where the, the robot's going to go to, where it's going to impact every, every aspect of your procedure. And here's just the you know, pre and post-op films. And um, you can use it with single position, too. I think it's a pain. Honestly, I don't think I have any time savings because you fiddle so much, but you can do it in, in that format as well. As you can see, all the residents are doing it all. I'm, I'm not even scrubbing. I'm the one taking the pictures uh, because it's pretty easy to do because, you know, with the robotic platform, they just do it all. Same thing with uh, SI Fusion. I, I think it impacted. I'm, I'm a little over, so I'm just going to blow through this. And so in summary, I think, uh, you know, there's a re relatively large volume of evidence supporting screw placement accuracy. There's less, less evidence with radiation exposure, but I do think it's a true finding that you are going to experience decreased radiation. I don't really wear lead, and I don't get radiated anymore. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. And I, I think operative time right now, I'm not sure there's a big time savings. I think going forward, it, it is refined. It will impact uh, efficiency. And it, you can use it for other aspects, not just this pedicle screw placement. Thank you.